Hi, so thanks for coming. This is the uh, the last lecture, and as, as every semester I like to do, I always have somebody from industry come give a, give a, give a guest lecture, because you, they're basically going to prove that Andy wasn't crazy or making <laughs> up during the last like, 15 weeks. Uh, so Anil is a uh, is a VP, is that correct? Or high up. But he's director of something at SAP in their, in their office <laughs> in Waterloo. Uh, and he's worked on HANA, and prior to, before SAP bought uh, Sybase, he worked on Sybase IQ for several years. Uh, he has his PhD from the University of Waterloo in Canada, which, as he and I were discussing today, is probably the largest database group in North America now. Right? They, have, they have way more, they have like over five or six professors. It's pretty amazing. Um, so he's been involved in the database industry for a long time. So he's here to talk about today about the in-memory database they've been building uh, for a while at, at SAP called HANA, which we've covered several times throughout the semester. So with that, go for it. There's your clicker. Yeah, OK. Uh, thanks, Andy. Welcome. Stop interrupting me ask questions as, as we go along. Yeah, that's right. So let's make it interactive a little bit. Uh, so interestingly, uh, my PhD thesis work was uh, in a field uh, that used to be called persistent programming. Yeah. And if I look back to that, that was uh, in-memory database management. Yes. Uh, 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 in any case, so today I want to talk uh, about HANA, give you an idea of uh, what we have been doing, and if I can figure out the clicker. Uh, so what I'd like to do is uh, give you a bit of a recap, right? Talk about SAP a little bit. Uh, talk about why, what was the original motivation for building HANA. Perhaps some of you have heard that before. Maybe my interpretation will be slightly different, which is always a good thing. And then, uh, uh, then I want to uh, talk about some key design principles for HANA, how it was architected, some of the core reasons. And then I'd like to take the opportunity to do a bit of a deep dive into two newer topics within HANA. One is adding uh, disk processing to HANA, and the other is the new query engine for HANA, and uh, talk about uh, why we are doing this. And then I'll wrap up with uh, what we see as the future challenges and key technical next stage for, the, for our team. And uh, I won't talk about then tomorrow in the database group lecture, then I'll pick it up from there and go into a lot more detail on what those challenges are and uh, what we intend to uh, do about it, right? And uh, as part of that, uh, one of the things you do in the industry is you get scars, right? So I'll talk a little bit about uh, this next challenge and uh, what we have been doing in the last two or three years. You know, as you try things, some things work, some things don't work. But generally speaking, nothing actually doesn't work. It just uh, you, it teaches you a new lesson to build the next big thing. So hopefully I'll paint that picture for you and then I'll talk about uh, uh, the cloud is becoming a big topic, generally speaking. Uh, so what we see as the key challenges there. Okay, so for those of you that are not familiar with SAP, obviously a very large uh, software company, depending on how you want to look at it uh, first or the third uh, in terms of market cap. And obviously 100,000 people working, a lot of acquisition in the recent days, as Andy mentioned. I joined SAP about uh, eight, seven, eight years ago as part of the Sybase acquisition. and uh, you will recognize some common names. And obviously, at the core, SAP remains the enterprise applications company. Uh, but uh, the database business has become quite substantial uh, for us, right? So depending on uh, how you count, maybe 10 to 15% of the revenue comes from databases, uh, including the Sybase uh, databases. So at the current time, the, uh, the, the, the Sybase, SAP database team uh, takes care of HANA, of course, but also the Cybase databases, uh, uh, SQL Anywhere, the Embedded Database, Cybase IQ, I'll talk about that a little bit, Parabyte Scale, uh, Big Data Management System, and ASE as the Enterprise OLTP system. So one team uh, manages all of that business, and obviously, uh, you know, the products are in different life cycle stages, right? So HANA being more on the core flagship side. So at the moment, we end up with five, five major countries that we have development teams in. Canada, where I'm from in Waterloo. I'll talk a little bit about that. Germany, obviously, then we have two locations there, Berlin and uh, Waldorf, which is one hour south of uh, Frankfurt. 
India, Pune, and then uh, <coughs> South Korea in Seoul, and then in China we have uh, three locations, but uh, uh, one major one in Xi'an, and then a significant presence in Shanghai, and uh, some in Beijing. Uh, so I, I, I work out of the Waterloo lab. I've lived in Waterloo for 30 years now. Uh, never left after my grad school. And uh, so the, the site is, uh, the, this Waterloo site is, uh, uh, has a long history, 35 years plus. Uh, uh, started as a spin-off from University of Waterloo. Some of you might have heard the what for Fortran compiler, uh, or maybe not uh, telling your age, so that uh, came from there. And then PowerSoft, Sybase, now SAP. Uh, more than half the team in Waterloo works on the database team. I right? didn't work on a whole bunch of uh, technologies, Cybers IQ, SQL Anywhere, uh, HANA, tooling, interfaces, drivers, and uh, we have a strong co-op and grad interns program. At any given point in time, my team would have about 14 students, uh, mostly undergrad students, but uh, we have a strong grad intern program. We get PhD students and master's students doing internships. And also now I have a PhD student that's in the lab for two years uh, as part of our uh, Waterloo program. Um, Trump is in your president, right? So you don't have to live in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. And, uh, and we are hiring now. So I have a, a dozen to two dozen positions open. We're hiring for different uh, functions. So there is links that you for look at it. Okay, so now going back to HANA, right? So uh, one thing to keep in mind as I talk through this, right? So the origins of HANA were not to build the build a general purpose database, although that will change a little bit. The original purpose was to build the leanest, meanest database platform we could do for SAP applications. So a lot of the focus was what do SAP applications need, right? In the end, that is our core business. And part of that comes from making those applications run better, faster, exploiting more hardware. But part of that is also, uh, you know, financial, because as SAP was writing uh, by uh, there was a big chunk of the SAP revenue that was going to the backends that SAP applications ran on. So it made business sense for us to do that. So the original idea that has a Plattner, uh, who still owns a whole bunch of the company. SAP, yeah, P in SAP, uh, was to argue that uh, that the traditional way of doing uh, enterprise systems, where you typically have two kinds of systems, the front-end systems and the back-end systems. And uh, this is uh, maybe nightly data extraction overemphasizing a little bit, uh, but nevertheless, the fundamentals remain the same, right? Traditionally, people still run their enterprise systems that way, right? And the argument was, well, is that uh, is that so good, right? So now, uh, I stay I stay at it here, right? So two systems, and then later on, perhaps we will argue that uh, uh, it's not necessarily about uh, uh, different components, but more about complexity of the overall system. And I'll I'll go into that uh, a little bit later. Uh, but 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 the key piece is that a lot of the big businesses like uh, Nestle or Pepsi and others, they rely on something called operational analytics, or they want to rely on operational analytics. What operational analytics means is, for a company boardroom at a boardroom level at a CEO level, being able to do analytics on live data as opposed to stale data. So it, this is about getting to a point where you could literally have a system running in a company boardroom and doing what-if analysis on the fly. That's very hard to do with uh, ETL-based systems. So the, so the, and of course, the ETL processes are, can, can become very complex. So then, based on that, that was the vision, right? So in the end, uh, the reality then was the initial objectives for HANA were to build a single system. And again, this is in the context of enterprise applications. Uh, right, and and in this case, enterprise application means the whole data business for uh, big companies is uh, to, in some sense, you could say that the sweet spot that we were trying to build this was that it's good enough for OLTP, right? So what does that mean? It doesn't mean we're trying to build a, a million transactions per second OLTP, and that's 
that's a niche area for most enterprise systems anyways, right? So something like 40,000 statements per second, and by a statement, think of it as a primary key lookup and an update based on that, for example, right? So being able to do that, uh, that's in terms of throughput. In terms of lat latency, then we would say good enough here would mean still pretty darn good. So when we're talking about one millisecond OLTP transactions, right? So fairly quick. Uh, but then Excel in analytics, because that's where uh, the, as the term operational analytics implies, that's where the value is. Being able to make quick decisions, being able to make real-time uh, decisions. And so everything we, did, we do, as you, as you will see later on, everything from the beginning is focused on really fast analytics. And analytics here could mean all sorts of things, right? So for example, in the, from a financial point of view, companies run dunning reports, uh, so-called dunning reports, right? Uh, and they could take days sometimes or hours. And the goal here was to make a real dent in that side. And so for many of these things, we are talking about achieving three to five orders of magnitude performance improvements. And that was the key goal, right? But then do it in one system, which means reduce complexity, run it. And again, once again, I emphasize for SAP applications and uh, uh, pick anyone uh, you want to, right? So then what I want to do next is then, based on that background, based on those objectives, what are some key concepts that we arrived at? And some of this may be, you know, repeating it for you, but uh, uh, we'll go through that, right? So at a high level, some very, very high level, looks like a typical database system, right? It has a parser, it has a SQL front end, it has a transaction manager, it does uh, persistency, et cetera, et cetera, right? A uh, couple of things. One is right off the bat, we said we're only gonna do snapshot isolation or MVCC, right? Uh, MVCC based transaction management because otherwise it's uh, very hard to bring everything into one system. The, the other thing to point out is that uh, uh, being able to do in member, okay, of course, the, 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 the whole motivation was we can exploit, build something from scratch that is purpose built for modern hardware. When I say modern hardware, I think it means two things for me. Multi-core, fully parallel across those, and large amounts of memory, right? What can we do? And fundamentally, we said, if you could do things from scratch, how would it look like? Uh, and then multi-model support was envisioned to be built in from the beginning. Now, you know, as we, as we go into the next journey, perhaps we would want to still have it inbuilt, but perhaps not as a monolith and break those things up in more, uh, dynamically deployable uh, components. Uh, user shared nothing uh, distributed computing, pretty standard uh, at that end, and we'll come back to that perhaps in a later way. Now, this is a very interesting, uh, I always go back to this. And when you look at this, this will explain to you the core design that we did, right? What this is trying to say is, for, remember, again, the goal is to build, do OLTP and OLAP in the same system. And if you first think about that, and if you have TPCC and TPCH in mind, you immediately run into some design challenges. How are you gonna design it? But then the key was that if, we, so the, 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 the numbers on the left, they were kind of like 12 representative enterprise workload system for applications. And we tried to look at what is the reality in terms of uh, what do those enterprise workloads represent, right? So if you can see here, right? So we're breaking it down by reads and writes and deletion and modification. And the key is that for both OLTP and OLAP, in the context of these enterprise applications, reads dominate the amount of work that's done, right? And uh, if you compare it to TPCC, which is the gold standard in some sense for benchmarking for OLTP applications, the, uh, we are more or less lined up on the basic selects, right? But the main difference is the, 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 the right part, the modifications. It's way heavily, uh, is way too many modifications over there, right? So uh, the rights are still important, but the key is that if you don't ma make sure that you are really good at the read side while supporting, uh, doing a good job on the right side, it's not, it's gonna be difficult to build a system that can do both in the same place. 
Can you say how common like the ring scans are for OTB? And like actually how, how wide are the scans? Uh, not very wide. Okay. So they're typically going to be, for example, if I look at a invoicing system, yeah. it's typically going to be finding, th think of it this way, uh, forget about the invoicing. In general, the application organizes itself around what's called a business object. And a business object could be an invoice or, or an order. And behind that order could be a bunch of invoices, a bunch of line items, et cetera, et cetera. So you're typically dealing with one object, business object at a time. And keep in mind that the SAP applications do a lot of logic in the application server itself. So from that perspective, they're not very wide scans. They're fairly narrow scans. But they are important, right? So as you see in this, the range selects are quite a big part of the, of the, of the mix. So then you will see in the design that while the uh, key lookups are important and we take care of that, we do want to pay attention to being able to do fairly efficient narrow range scans. Okay, and that you will see that in the design. So yeah. How about conflicts, right? Like uh, in, in the production work, you will see, especially in whole OTP, you will see uh, some very high and skill the conflict in workload, or in most of cases, the conflict is very low. It's handled a lot in the application level. So at the database level, for these applications, doing snapshot isolations where reads are block free, there is conflicts. But uh, keep in mind that the application is doing a bunch of the heavy lifting as well. And so that's not at the database level, we've, the snapshot isolation is good enough. And, uh, and it's not a big uh, issue, oh, generally speaking. Okay, so then you will see this key. So then basically what we, uh, then we ended up is that we're gonna have an in-memory system store and it's gonna be a column store. Uh, that was uh, an early decision as well. Now there is a row store as you might have heard about in HANA, but it's, uh, it's, uh, that's not where the focus is in some sense. So it is used, it's primarily used for two things, right? One is the, the metadata is maintained in that store for the database and then Applications will use the row store for small hot tables uh, uh, sometimes, and that's where some of the resolutions can be done. Okay, so then we ended up with effectively a, now this this kind of a design is becoming quite common, right? Uh, a lot of databases are ending up uh, uh, in this kind of a design. So the store consists of two portions. One is called the main, and the main is the uh, it's read optimized. Uh, focused on reach, being able to do that really, really quick, and you will see some of the key uh, design choices beyond what columnar databases always do, right? Columnar databases always try to do dictionary compression, for example, so that's standard. But the point was, what can we do more than that? Given that we want to do reads very, very fast, and we want to exploit in-memory processing and the modern hardware, SIMD instructions, and so on. So the, so the main is, uh, it's, it's immutable, so which means the database is organized in two, each table, let's say, when I said, uh, think of it as a partition of a table. Everything in this context, you can think of one partition of one table. So, it's, so the data for the table is stored in two, let's say, fragment or segments. One is called the main part that is immutable, it doesn't change until it's recomputed, right? Uh, it's super compressed. So the starts with dictionary encoding, dictionary compression for the data, but because it's immutable, it's gonna be immutable for the duration of this time, we do some extra processing upfront to get more compression and denser packing of the column values in memory so you can get through more values at a time. So what it does is the following. Once dictionary encoding is done, you end up with column vectors which have uh, effectively value IDs from the dictionary. So now there is an extra step which says, and, and this is mostly heuristic driven today, uh, what it does is we say for this data set, what can I do if I can sort the rows in any way I want, in some way I want, can I do additional compression? So a very simple example of that would be if I have a column with two or three distinct values, then I could sort along that column and then do run length encoding. So there is about half a dozen different compression techniques that are deployed. And it's, it's a, as I said, it's a heuristic decision that made up front based on these things, and then we compress it down further. So which means now you get a really compressed format for, 
for the main store. So that has to, that has benefits both in terms of how much memory you use. Uh, so, you, so as I say here, for some examples, that could be a factor of 10 additional compression on top of dictionary compression. But the second more important thing is scans can get faster because now you're packing more values into into com especially if you're using SIMD instruction, right? So that is, that is the key piece. Now, obviously, it's not a read-only data warehouse, so we do want to make modifications, right? So then, delta is something that sits on top, and that's what tracks the updates. So the key, two key pieces to it, two or three key pieces to it. One is that this is write optimized, right? All changes to the rows in the partition again, the unit is partition here, are tracked in the delta store. So what kind of changes can I do? I can insert a row. If I insert a new row, it just goes into the delta store. I could delete a row that already existed. If the row I'm deleting happens to be in the delta store, then I just mark it as deleted. Let's say I have a, I maintain a bitmap that says which rows are deleted, right? If a row I'm deleting happens to be in the main currently, I remember main is immutable. So I don't change main, I simply record in delta that I deleted this row without going into detail, but a simple implementation, for example, could be a bitmap, which is a delete bitmap, right? And if I update a row, then that's tracked as a delete followed by an insert. So effectively I delete, I mark the row in the main deleted, and I insert a new row into the delta. So now of course the query processing has to take this into account. So effectively then there is a view consistent view manager for every, any query that comes in goes to that view manager and you know it's fairly straightforward to say what is the view that I present to the application that asking for a particular, remember this is MVCC, it's version control, so I'm looking for a particular version. Main is fixed as of a particular version. So what I'm effectively doing is I'm saying the data for this query is all of the rows in main minus the rows that are marked as deleted in delta plus the rows that are in delta, okay? So those are the key pieces. The other key piece is that the delta store is maintained as a simple append-only store. And that, 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 that has huge implications because locking, uh, version control, it simplifies a whole bunch of, it makes things faster, let's say, to find. So all appends, delta is an append-only store. So now, <clears throat> oh sorry, one thing I forgot to mention. Uh, uh, I talked about uh, the sorting, right? So there are two sortings that are taking place. One is that the dictionary is sorted. Typically in a dictionary encoded uh, compression scheme, you will not sort the dictionary because if you're gonna modify the dictionary, then it can be a huge cost to recode everything. But in main, things are not going to change for the life of a main. So the dictionary is sorted. So that has advantages because now range scans uh, are much easier to do. Otherwise, you have to scan the whole thing. And the second was the the column vector itself is sorted, but that's more for compression purposes than anything else. Okay. What data structure are you using for the dictionary? Sorry. What, what is the data structure you're using for the dictionary? Just that. I think it's a hash map. Uh, uh, I need to check uh, fully. Okay. When you say the columns are sorted, does all the columns have to be sorted according to the same? Order? Yes. Oh, okay. The sorting is for row, at a row level. So, so which means part of the heuristic would be to pick one sorting order that achieves the maximum completion for all columns, right? So that, that's not an exact science, so it's a, it's a heuristic, okay? Uh, in the delta store, dictionary is not sorted. Again, obviously, because uh, sorting the dictionary would mean re-encoding re everything, and that's difficult. There is a B3 index to, uh, to allow for fast, unique lookup, and check. So there is less compression of delta, data, data, but there is more uh, write performance is much, much better. And a lot of uh, uh, log-free uh, algorithms, et cetera, are implemented. Now, obviously, you can't keep running like this, right? So yeah, there is a price to be paid. And the price to be paid is that every so often, you have to merge the changes into the delta into the main and create a new main, more or less, right? So uh, the thing you're in the delta store is like, it's a delta. So if I, have a, if I insert a tuple, I have to materialize the entire tuple in the delta store. Then if I update one of 10 attributes, the next thing I see in, the, in that log is just the, the update to that one attribute, right? 
No, so that's uh, that's. Uh, so it's not it's just the whole row. Okay. It's the so so that's uh, that's a potential uh, uh, e potential issue in some sense because they need to pull the row out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The new row. Right. So again, that's the <coughs> ten only version storage we talked about. And we talked about yeah. Even though it's a delta, it's it's a it's a it's, a, it's, a, it's the two. Right. Yeah. Right. So so now the merge needs to be done now. So how will the merge uh, uh, work? Uh, so basically, we want to restore uh, restore order. So now, you, as you can imagine, right? So there is a cost to be paid, and the cost to be paid is in the merge. So I'll, I'll describe the merge process quickly, but then there is improvements being made to the merge process itself because it becomes a it becomes a point of contention at some point, right? Uh, depending on the rate of changes and so on. Uh, so the so the just, just at a high level, right? So uh, we can't afford to block the system up while merge is taking place. So it's kind of done as an online operation. Uh, not fully online, but there is, a, there is a little bit of a lock you need to take when you switch over to the new delta. But more or less, uh, going back to what I was talking about before, if you look at the leftmost before merge view, so you have a delta, you have a main, right operations are all going against the delta. Read operations have to read from both main and delta to create the consistent view for any given query. When merge starts, during that time, we have to keep the current queries as well as uh, new queries that arrive potentially because we haven't committed something yet, let's say. I'm still working on the previous version. So the read operations continue working against the, so we basically start a new delta, uh, delta in this intermediate phase. If a query arrives that or was already running before this process started, then that goes against main one and delta one, right? Because that's the view they were looking at. If a query arrives later on, then that has to pull potentially from the old main, the old delta, and the new delta, because some of the new versions might be there. In the meanwhile, we, we rebuild. So the, so the merge process is effectively uh, take the old main, take the delta corresponding to it, and we are going to merge the two. So at the end of it, we will end up with a new main that contains all the rows from main before, minus the rows that were deleted from main, and the new rows from delta. Generally speaking, assume for simplicity here, and I think that's mostly the case as well, which is we're going to take the committed rows from delta. Uh, those are the ones that need to be merged into main. And then we need to take the uncommitted rows from the previous delta and carry them over to the new delta, at least in a logical way, right? And then, so this happens uh, uh, online, and then at some point at the end, we say, okay, we're done. At that point, there is a small lock, and we flip over to the next delta. So that's more or less. Now, obviously, as you can see, this is a potentially memory-intensive operation. So, so as a rough guidance, uh, during the merge process, you need twice the memory, uh, at least for that uh, data, right? So then, as I said, uh, as, as the new, I'll talk about the new query engine and the new execution engine later on. Over time, we'll look to make this process a little bit more uh, memory friendly. Okay, uh, this is just an example of uh, extra compression that we can do, run length encoding, right? So pretty obvious. So uh, you do with your dictionary encoding, then you sort the rows, and then you store, then you compress the column vector with run length encoding. So if I only had two values, I would end up with uh, effectively four values in my entire column, right? How many times if the first value happens, how many times the second value happens, and that's it. Regardless of how many rows I have, I could have a billion rows in the column. I still have this fixed size for that column, right? Okay, uh, just to briefly mention, of course, I'm not gonna go into that detail, so you're mostly familiar with SIMD processing, so very, very heavy use of that. In fact, uh, uh, from the beginning of HANA, we have had some very intense uh, collaboration with Intel and many of the uh, SSE 2.3 and AVX instructions were developed by Intel based on our uh, collaboration and need. Uh, there is a, in fact, there has been a, a reasonably large Intel team that sits in the uh, HANA office in Waldorf and works with us. Uh, okay. so. That's the, uh, that's I wanted to stop there for the overview and then I want to go into two of the, uh, as I said, uh, focus topics. Any quick questions at this point? Okay, so let's talk about the query engine a little bit. So, 
to be clear, this is the new one. This is the old one. Oh, this is the old one, okay. So, so you're, you're about to talk about the new one. I'm um, worth okay, right. right. So I just want to paint, paint this picture, right? So for historical reasons, Hana has this uh, interest. Remember, this is actually this is this is really good. Uh, so we have specialized engines. So there is a join engine that focuses on, uh, you know, being able to uh, uh, do uh, join reductions and so on. There is a, something called an OLAP engine. Uh, not yeah, OLAP engine. Which uh, so Hana has the Hana supports SQL, but Hana also supports this some so-called analytical views, and that has some special uh, syntax and considerations, and that can run the analytical queries for SAP application. So it's SQL plus some uh, some some tweaks to it. But but, but not joins. Like... Joins well. So good point, right? So. So we end up with a situation now where some same semantic query could take different paths, right? Uh, joins mostly end up in the join engine, right? But uh, uh, the for, but this this causes some problems. One is that there is uh, uh, you have to keep all of them up, to, you know, up to speed. And then the, the the bigger problem is depending on which code path a particular semantically equivalent query takes and how it's written. So the analytical views is, as I said, special syntax language that goes through the OLAP engine. So depending on which path it takes, we could end up with different performance characteristics and then we have to guide. So, so going forward, we're gonna consolidate that into a single, and the other thing is uh, uh, the, the processing is set-based uh, internally, right? So uh, the intermediate result sets are fully materialized before they're passed on to the to the to the next stage. So, so those are the, some of the changes we want to make uh, because I guess what sort of could be confusing for the students is like I just spent the, you know, the entire semester saying OLAP <coughs> equals joins, right? And then now you're saying <coughs> yeah, there's a join engine for joins, and then OLAP is join plus something else. So what, like, so can you say what the something else is? The, the, so there is uh, uh, there is SQL. There is there is a this analytical views is a special syntax okay. that the application uses, and I think originally it uh, allows you to specify things that you wouldn't easily uh, write in SQL. Okay, so right? beyond aggregation. Beyond yeah yeah, uh, I can get you. I can find the specific details so uh, and then, right? okay. uh, so then uh, that worked quite well as long as your our target set was the specific applications we were optimizing against, right? But as we get into more general purpose uh, focus areas, being allowing more applications to be developed, then that causes some uh, some issues, right? So uh, some short running queries, uh, and uh, again, as you we were talking about this morning, the uh, the original the genesis was. That there is close collaboration between the application, which are own application, and in fact, sometimes the BW, uh, the BW is our data warehouse uh, 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 team, and we sit together and kind of do things specifically for that for for their needs, custom team. That works well, but as you go and try to attract more use cases and customers, particularly migrating from other uh, uh, databases. To Hana, then that becomes an issue because this is outside of SAP. Out non SAP applications, okay. non SAP applications, right? Uh, what typically happens is that even in the SAP customers that are running SAP applications, they often have needs to write custom apps against the same data, right? And so, so that gets harder. So the new query engine then uh, there is a new query engine uh, being built, uh, Hex. Uh, one of the goals is to reduce uh, memory footprint, right? And part of that comes from, as I said before, the current execution engines are set based. And so uh, this new engine will add streaming support between operators, but still not, generally speaking, we don't want to go to tuple at a time processing because then uh, that's key for us. So it adds, and it adds pipelining, it adds uh, uh, streaming support. And the goal would be for this engine to replace all the other engines. Right, so that work has already kind of going on. More and more are, things are going through the common SQL optimizer, common runtime. In the current shipping version uh, that just shipped, actually, uh, th this engine is live. So it's currently handling a subset of uh, classes of queries 
that get routed to the new engine. Uh, not everything is uh, routed there, but the goal would be to replace uh, all the other engines with this uh, one engine. And the new engine will exploit, uh, continue to exploit the key uh, techniques that we have, right? which is working on compressed data, working on uh, 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 SIMD uh, instructions and so on. Uh, and in that process, co uh, it's code generation based as well. And then keeping a close eye on the work going on, for example, in Hyper and uh, uh, other databases. He's already written a new one. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Right. So, to Thomas, just for people that don't know, right? So we, we had. We know. Oh, you know. Okay. <laughs> we, <laughs> so, we read this paper. We know. Yeah. So we we have had strong uh, uh, history working with Thomas, and a lot of his work got into the product. Uh, so generally speaking, uh, uh, uses LLVM for machine generation code. Uh, currently, we don't go directly to IR, and instead we generate L, it's easier to look at, easier to debug, etc. And then we're using an L interpreter uh, to, uh, to, to generate uh, code. Um, and L is, L is a specific language that SAP wrote, but like you guys had this before you did this, right? It's already in the product before we did. Okay. Right, so, so there is already, uh, L is already used in, the, in, in HANA before we started building the Hex engine, okay. right? Um, and then, of course, uh, uh, the, 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 so that's currently the current state of the engine. Uh, of course, broadening its uh, scope, broadening uh, the set of queries it can handle with the goal to replace the other engines. Now, uh, of course, completion tie up. L already contains implications of SQL special functions. Right? So that, like, you're relying on, right now, so you have an L interpreter. So the, the, you're basically, Converting the the scan operators and the filters and the aggregations into L script and letting that interpreter handle that. And yeah. it has its own functions to do existing built-ins, uh, existing functions that we can now leverage. Okay. Going through the interpreter, right? We wouldn't be able to do that if we went directly to IR from. Uh, so if you use L now in Hana without the element engine to write your store procedure, like. Like the, the, the data engine could have its own, I don't know, add years together, add two years together, it has its own function and L has its own now. Right. Okay. So, so, the, so the current stored procedure execution uses L internally. Okay. Right? So we're just piling onto the same implementation. It's consistent, it's easier to read, easier to debug, as opposed to going to IR directly is the, is the main point. Okay. Right? Uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, when to generate code, when to not generate code, so that thing is all going. So we're gonna, uh, the, the L interpreter is, uh, needs more work, right? So it's not uh, uh, fully optimal, etc. So we will continue to work on that. Uh, I already talked about this currently, uh, to avoid completion times, uh, uh, you know, uh, there is, uh, the, 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 the perform the execution can start uh, right away. So kind of, uh, there will be more work needed in this area, and then of course, uh, uh, the, the, this the, this this slide and the next slide mostly that's, talks that's, about. That's, we covered that paper too. That's Victor's. Go back, sorry. This this yeah, one. That, that's yeah. That's Victor's paper on the adaptive query execution, where they they generate the IR and then interpret that, and then back on the compiler. Right. So this one and the next slide is kind of tracking things that we we want to look at going forward, right? Uh, and again, so some other challenges, or uh, so that's kind of uh, when do you do when, when you do com when you compile when you do late materialization, etc. Okay, All right. Uh, so then we'll switch topics to now uh, adding this processing to the. Uh, so uh, as Andy and I were talking about before, so there's this ongoing. Uh, question about you want to do in-memory processing in a database, how do you, st where do you start? Do you start at a disk-based engine and add in-memory processing, or do you purpose build from scratch an in-memory engine and then we add this processing to that? Yeah. I have a question about the compilation thing. Mm -hmm. Like, it seems like a common trend in industry to go from a sort of compilation based environment to a compilation based environment. Mm -hmm. Like, I remember during the there's also a thing for Redshift, they compile C++ and they just cache all their queries that they compile. So like, what kind of optimizations are you guys looking to do that? Like, 
How do you plan on optimizing like that interpretation part? I, I think that's, an, that, that's part of the work that needs to happen. It's not clear. I don't think there's a clear answer on when do you go the, uh, the uh, L interpretation route and when do you compile. The, I think the trade-off is uh, execution time and the compilation time, right? So I don't think we have all the answers at this point. It sounds like you're not catching anything. No. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, I don't know what L looks like, but I imagine Compiling C++ is more expensive, and that's why they have to do that. Plus, at their scale. Yeah. So, uh, then going back to the, the disk processing engine, right? Uh, so clearly, there is need to add some disk capability, disk processing capabilities to the to to an in-memory database, right? Uh, there's the obvious thing of uh, you know an expectation that a database doesn't stop when you run out of memory, although for, it might be okay for some application, but even if you discount the data size, uh, it's not a general expectation that uh, intermediate results blow up your memory. You want to be able to, uh, to deal with that. And that's one, and then as, as the adoption increases for the database, you end up with situations where you want some native capabilities to be able to age data or keep data together as opposed to if you have no disk capabilities in the database, then you have no opportunity to say, hey, uh, some of my data is now less important. I don't want to pay the same cost of processing the data as my hot data, and, the, and I don't want to offload that data to a, to a different system altogether, right? Because I want some uh, transactional consistency. Can you publicly say like, some examples, or, like you don't have to like, name customer names, like just give, like, what are some really large in-memory time installations that you guys are dealing with? Sure. Uh, a 48 terabyte production system. Okay. Single, single node. Yeah. Uh, uses an HPI uh, uh, machine. Uh, I'm not sure whether... So that, that, they're, like, they're, they're maintaining refresh, refresh on like 48 terabytes of DRAM. Th that's right. Yeah, it's and great. it's a live system. It's, a it's in production. And then 48 terabytes is not enough for the system. So then they wanted to add then uh, some disk to that uh, for aging yeah. purposes, right? So uh, 48 terabytes is probably not uh, very common, but there is multiple systems globally in that range, yeah. right? And, and again, it comes down to what I was talking about before. If there is business critical processes that you can run in minutes or seconds instead of hours and days, then the, the people have people can find uh, business value in maintaining these large systems, right? Uh, multi terabyte uh, for sweet spot is probably four to eight terabytes, but I'm uh, we need to uh, check that. But uh, there is large systems uh, available. And this is not even this is not even scale out. This is a single node system. Yeah. Right. So I have a question. It's a little bit uh, twist back to the earlier part about column store versus this like append only delta <coughs> store, right? And just I'm wondering, typically in Hana, what's the ratio between the two of the? Oh, it's not ratio, but <coughs> like they have a fixed size of delta uh, store. <coughs> um, keep in mind that uh, the current database uh, implementation has a two billion row limit on a single partition. So that kind of gates your, uh, uh, gates your data sizes, right? How large delta grows uh, varies. But there are two, there are two ways that uh, the merge process gets triggered. One is we just periodically do it, regardless of the rate of change. And then there are thresholds that are in place that trigger the merge process. But generally speaking, uh, the largest you can allow, th th there, is a, there is a threshold, hard threshold, that you want to not cross because the merge process will need twice the memory, at least for, a, for that one merge. Uh, if your question is, what's a typical ratio that people maintain, I, I'm not sure I can answer that uh, right off the bat, but uh, that should give you, so I can get you some more information on that. Sure. Okay. Uh, but 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 they they can get uh, they can get large, 
they can get large, right? Because there is obviously a design or a or an operational trade-off. Doing two, you want the switch port on when to trigger the merge. You want don't want to the larger the. There, there's one more thing to keep in mind. It's okay if the delta grows quite large if it's you're do, doing mostly inserts, right? right? right. Or if you're do, mostly doing inserts or you're mostly modifying recent rows where everything is in the delta because then it's fairly efficient to get the query result. But if you end up with a lot of main rows being modified, then it will impact performance, right? Okay, so, so there is two things I want to talk about today and then tomorrow I'll talk a little bit more on this topic. Uh, so we started to add some uh, uh, disk-based processing, let's say. The original work we did that was uh, kind of published in Sigma 2016, the work actually happened a little bit before that. The objective there was not necessarily to add this processing as a, as a primary objective. The, the key that, the, that, was, that work was mostly trying to achieve some memory relief, right? Because as you get in, and in most, especially in the, in the SAP uh, application data sets, you end up with columns that are not so critical from a processing point of view. And so the objective, what we, what we said is, well, generally speaking, you need this memory for the data set to be kept in, in, in memory. If there are some columns that are not so critical to me, can I use less memory for processing that column, doing a query on that column? Remember, in the original design, the entire, at least for a column that you're working on, the entire column data structures have to be fully memory resident before you can do any do scans on that, right? But now if I have columns where I'm willing to pay a little bit of a penalty on scanning a column, so it's, it's not that business critical. And secondly, I'm mostly doing, I'm effectively doing a scan on that column. Can we do that with less memory on the main particularly? Delta is such to be in memory. For the main, can we do that, right? Uh, but we didn't want to necessarily go to a paged, uh, a traditional disk-based uh, paging format, so we, because we still wanted to be able to do tight memory loops over chunks of data. So that's where this page loadable column idea came from. And the main idea here was that you have a regular in-memory column, but if I'm doing a scan on that, I can do the scan by bringing it in memory piecemeal. Still in big chunks, but piecemeal, right? So that's uh, uh, that's basically what it talks uh, about here, right? So then the idea was that we still have vectorized storage, but instead of uh, loading the entire vector in memory, can I just bring it in chunks? So pieces of the vector. Uh, similarly, so it, for the vectors, for the dictionaries, for search, and the indexing, right? And then, uh, uh, so, so it's only for the read optimized portion, which is the main portion, right? Uh, and then, uh, and keep in mind, to going back to your point, right? So even if we, I don't have a fixed answer for you, in most workloads, the majority of the data is going to be in main, right? So which means memory consumption is heavily dominated by data that's in main. So if you can give, bring memory relief, that was a kind of like a quick way for us to bring some relief into the systems. And then as you will see later on, that idea then grew into a more... Uh, into something, the VLDB 29 this year, there'll be an industry track paper that talks about something called native storage uh, uh, extension. So that adds, I would say, a, a bit more holistic disk processing uh, to, to, to the system. Uh, because it's done at the in the HANA engine itself, then the goal is to try to do that in a way where all of the processing applies equally to that uh, uh, to that uh, uh, that that uh, data so in contrast to i'll talk about tomorrow uh, an attempt for us to build a system with the, using hana and iq as two separate systems together but there it becomes very difficult to maintain the same kind of uh, uh, functionality uh, together um, again this is transparent to the application the idea goal is to be able to do this uh, without requiring uh, without requiring uh, application changes. And uh, if I can go to this uh, diagram a little bit, 
kind of gives you an idea of how this is being built. So, uh, key, so remember with the page, the previous page loadable columns I talked about, we already started to come up with a disk format that was conducive to bringing vectors, segments of vectors into memory and process them with essentially the original uh, memory uh, SIMD processing, etc. So now with this one, uh, effectively we come up with a common format on disk that uh, is used for all data, but the choice whether compared to the previous one, there the user is explicitly making a priority choice which says, I want this piecemeal loading capability for a particular column. This one says we're going to store all data in a common format and then at runtime we have the ability to run it using the page primitives. The, really the main difference between the two is this one assumes contiguous uh, uh, memory vectors fully in memory whereas the other ones is chunk wise, right? We want to use uh, common primitives for example SIMD scans as much as possible and uh, you will see some of the things that you will normally do in a in a in a display system. So the, there was an existing object buffer cache that's being expanded to deal with more holistically with the. Uh, uh, so this this will start to become more like a traditional buffer cache uh, in that sense. But still, it's not dealing with uh, fixed size pages, but rather uh, 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 chunks of vectors. What makes it elastic? Elastic buffer cache. Uh, I, I think the goal is to. Uh, make uh, okay before I answer that right so one of the goals is for the engines to automatically decide based on access patterns which way uh, I want to do process a given uh, vector right whether I want to load it all and do use memory uh, semantics or do I want to do it piecewise so in that cost the elastic basically means that the this is not something that we want a user to decide upfront so that this can grow uh, so because remember the memory is shared between uh, between the buffer cache for the right side and the normal in memory. So Elastic essentially says that the, I, the engine can do trade-offs. Do more memory here or do more memory here. So this is a loaded question, but did you consider MMAP? <laughs> 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 MMAP has been considered on and off for the history of HANA. Yeah, and <laughs> uh, can we take this conversation offline? Uh, uh, the, the short answer in the end was that it didn't work uh, yeah. as expected. <laughs> Interestingly, uh, sorry for a short diversion. So for my PhD thesis, my persistent memory system was a map based uh, persistent programming. So the, the idea was that, uh, uh, you remember the goals of persistent programming? They, don't, they have no idea what that is. Uh, so, okay, so the, the, the goal was to build, make persistence an orthogonal property of data. So all data should be first class. Today it's not, right? So if a data goes to disk, forget about type safety, for example. So anyway, so my work was to use MMAP in those days. And uh, in fact, I, I sat down with Microsoft one day, guys, you do operating, if the operating system can support MMAP more holistically, I think it could be a thing of beauty, but it's not. <laughs> but this is like 99, 98? 99, 98. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah. Still Actually, before. I was done in 96. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, sorry. That that keeps coming back. But but the, but the it's also an idea that doesn't die. So maybe there is something there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I make public statements about how much I hate that. And we're trying to prove it. That sucks. We'll, we'll come back to you. Uh, yeah, I, I have uh, I have pains about around MMAP. Uh, so we'll build a recommendation engine. The, uh, you know, just uh, uh, theoretically, the vision here would be that you don't need uh, the user doesn't need to make any choices. That uh, we are able to convert, use either format on the fly. Uh, so. But uh, reality, of course, would be that uh, there, is a, there is a cost to be paid runtime if you decide in the fly to go from one to the other. And uh, like most uh, you know, self-driving uh, systems, there is a period of time where we get to the utopia. Right? So in the meanwhile, we will 
We're trying to build a recommendation engine. At the moment, it's mostly heuristic based, looks at statistics, tries to uh, make recommendations to the user as to uh, which, which way to go. It's pretty rudimentary at this point, but the goal would be to tie it into that, uh, uh, that uh, intelligent HANA project we have where uh, we could learn over time. And this is maybe uh, this is something uh, we can talk about as well in your in the in the context of your work. Okay, so that's about I have. So then I want to wrap up with two things. One is obviously Hana has been extremely successful for what it was designed for, right? Which was uh, solve the operational analytics use case. Uh, you know, uh, I've uh, not seen uh, the business relevance it gained uh, very quickly, and it has brought a lot of benefits to the. Uh, to, to customers. Uh, again, the, the original motivation was uh, build a single system, keep it simple, no aggregates, no, that, that's the initial starting point, right? So the, the goal was that the system doesn't need uh, materialized views, system doesn't need uh, indexing, uh, because all of those things add to complexity and to the cost for the load side. But of course, over time, we have selected, selectively added some capabilities here. Uh, if you go look into the HANA documentation, you will see something called cached views. That's kind of like uh, some form of uh, materialization. But they are dynamic, uh, dynamically uh, created. So what are the next steps, next challenges, right? Cost, uh, cloud is a big uh, topic. I want to talk a little bit about that uh, tomorrow. Uh, memory footprint, reducing memory footprint, uh, hardware costs, uh, you know, uh, for certain use cases, as I said, 48 terabyte uh, system for this large company, uh, it serves that uh, their needs, but of course there are other use cases where uh, you want to reduce, uh, relieve that. Uh, there is, uh, you know, ongoing work about uh, uh, so going back to my original point about enterprise systems having two systems, specialized engines, et cetera, et cetera. So now if you walk, if you go outside the sweet spot that we defined for HANA, then yes, uh, we need to uh, build a specialized engine, specialized things. But now the, the goal and motivation for us is, can we do the heavy lifting for the user and present to the user a single system, system, which is not a single server, maybe sometimes we use the term system of systems and do some heavy lifting inside. So I'll talk a little bit about what we are doing there. Okay, so okay. pretty much an hour. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. We have time for questions. But I'll say again, like I didn't tell him to say any of the things he said, right? <laughs> uh, in terms of like, you know, they, they, they use snapshot isolation. I said that's what we want to do, or that uh, don't use MMAP, but that was I got that out of here. Um, yeah, so any questions? I'm just curious, right? For the use case of Karna, I was wondering uh, <laughs> do you have a number at top of our mind of what's the ratio between like, this traditional relational data processing versus I don't know the text search graph or whatever? Um, I, I think tax search has uh, the, the, quite a so text. So let me separate uh, tax search from text analytics, right? So uh, there is a place for tax search that should be more natively into the database and uh, graphs. Uh, it's interesting, but I'm not sure we're not seeing a lot of. Uh, 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 it's an interesting topic. I think part of the issue is that companies are trying to figure out how to make business sense and use of it, mm -hmm. right? So we uh, spatial uh, similar story. So there is some very intense uh, relevant use cases, but it's not still mainstream in in that sense, right? So. Uh, for the most part, I would say the most data processing is still relational from what I see. Even in the big data use case, you know, but the, we, we make a lot about uh, in the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years, 
we have talked a lot about uh, variety, but uh, I think to this date, volume is the biggest problem and velocity perhaps. Because even when we ha you have structured, unstructured data use cases, oftentimes they boil down to keep the unstructured data objects available for drill downs or for reference, but do entity extraction, store the, uh, the, the, the data about the objects, do your searching and uh, relational processing over that, then you have a, maybe you have a result set that you want the original objects for. So I, I have examples of customers where they would have petabytes worth of unstructured objects, but they don't want to look at it until there is a very specific, so for example, this, there is this uh, use case about a company that uh, uh, provides enterprise solutions where companies have need to catalog and uh, store all the voicemails and uh, all sorts of things in the company. And then nobody needs those voicemails until there is a litigation happening somewhere and you need to go back to. So what they do then is they write customized software that uh, you feed this uh, unstructured objects through, they extract all sorts of information, you know, going as far as uh, sentiment uh, analysis, etc. But nevertheless, it boils down to a few pieces of uh, structured information, store that in the database. If with columnar databases, you can also then keep the original object and store it as a column in the database, right? And then it's there, you, you don't have to maintain those files, and then most of your processing is happening on the structured data. I see. Cool. Right? And uh, so, sorry, since you asked, right? So I have an opinion on that as well, right? So this is the issue with the today's uh, so-called data lakes in the traditional sense, right? So if I define data lake with a the theoretical sense, it's about keeping the raw data model-less, schema-less, et cetera. That's kind of like saying, you know, most applications have data models. Right? And so very quickly, this, these data lakes become swamps. Right? And uh, so I, I, I think uh, in the end, uh, relational, call it relay, okay, let, let's me not use the word relational. Let's just say structure. Right? No, I, no, 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 I will go for it. Yeah. But, but what I'm trying to distinguish from is, uh, uh, relational to me means two things, right? One is relational style structured data processing. And the other is, when I say relational, my brain immediately says acid as well, right? So, so for, for a lot of use cases, actually both go together. I will talk about a use case tomorrow where it's a 20, 30 petabyte active data use case and they have relational requirements in the sense that they can't lose any records. These are business relevant records. And so I think relational is here to stay. Personally, mm. right? It's not a controversial statement. It's not, not, no. You're not on a limb by yourself about no, it. No, no, no. Uh, that's right. And uh, so, but at the same time, um, you know, we do have to adopt. Uh, uh, so, for example, I, I'll talk about tomorrow. If we have to move, if we all have to move to the cloud and, uh, and the cloud vendors don't change uh, uh, how they provide infrastructure, the current uh, architectures will not work because they were designed with this different uh, uh, underlying, uh, sorry, when I say they won't work, they won't work as is. Uh, most of them, how much work you need to do to make them work will vary from design to design, right? In some cases, it will be simple things. In some cases, it will be significant things. So for the, in this case here, like the graph engine or the, or the text search engine, I right, take the graph one for example. Like, <coughs> is that, is that underneath the covers, is the same storage engine that you've used the Rose or Palm Store, is it or a completely separate system? It's um, uh, it's mostly execution engine, uses the underlying column storage. Yeah, okay, okay. okay. Right. Yeah, it's uh, with some, uh, with some uh, uh, caveats, right? So for example, if I look at the text search, uh, so the text mining builds an in-memory text index, let's say, uh, that's a complex structure, so it's yeah. not uh, stored as is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spatial is mostly stored uh, in the column store, but adaptations of it. So, for example, we did a, uh, so, the, the, so the column store is co called the attribute store or whatever, right? But there is uh, specializations on that. So, for example, if you want to s uh, store series data into the column store, the column store remains the same, but you now need 
a few additional tweaks. You want maybe a revolving door compression or some different kinds of things. So those kind of things get played. Okay, uh, so tomorrow then, uh, so then we'll talk about uh, our experience on, uh, on uh, bringing these different uh, engines together and what we think about it. No, let me define. Um, if you write an if you write a query in an analytical view, that always goes to the all up engine, right? But you could write a equivalent SQL query that represents the same computation, but that will go through the the the, the, the different code paths. It won't go through the all up engine, and uh, the optimizations are different sometimes because. Uh, the, the the amalgamation hasn't taken place, so you could end up with different uh, performance characteristics, uh, and that's inevitable, right? Because uh, if you have uh, the, these engines are running more or less uh, independently, uh, so you will get that kind of a thing where you have the you can express you can express the semantically equivalent computation different ways. They give you the same results, but your performance characteristics might differ. That's what I meant. Generally speaking, not right because, uh, as I said, analytical views. It, you are. Uh, it's, it's a specialized engine that interprets that specific, uh, uh, but that will change with. Uh, so currently, as we bring the Hacks engine, it's coming in kind of like in a, in a staged way. It handles a certain classes of queries, and currently there is not a lot of intermingling that takes place. But over time, that might be the case. Right, so some of these students have taken the, the introduction class in the, in the fall semester, and that was all disk-based databases. And in this one, we, we threw away the buffalo manager, so it's all in memory. So you, so you having worked on the side base, have experience in code. So I guess the question for you would sort of finish up the semester would be, what are some things that like, since you started working on HANA as an in-memory database that surprised you or just completely threw you, know, threw you for a loop or maybe confused you that coming from a disk-based system and working with an in-memory database that was, that they could not be different? Or is it all the same? Well, uh, so, so, <laughs> so let me go back to the 2009 uh, Hasso's first uh, lecture. So I'm sitting there as a Sybase employee, of course, right? And my, uh, you know, my first reaction is, well, that makes a lot of sense. Why didn't we think of that? Uh, and so, uh, I, I think looking at the you saw when Hasso Planner presented, here's what Hana is going to be in 2009. Yes, you were in the audience. Yes, but you didn't work for him yet because he didn't buy you yet. That's right. Okay, okay. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, but SAP was not a database company at that point, right? Yeah. So, so uh, I think it's not, uh, uh, the, the general story has been uh, as, at a philosophical level, right? So looking at the technology and the evolution, uh, I, I, I think we are starting to get to a point where we are saying the lessons we learned here in the disk-based processing, some of those are valuable lessons, perhaps don't need to be implemented exactly the same way. And there has been also migration the other way around, right? So because if uh, in, uh, in, the, in the IQ case, right, let me use that example, right? So we did implement something after coming together, something similar to the HANA Delta store into IQ later on, right? So, but it's done somewhat differently because uh, the IQ implementation was also uh, MVCC, snapshot, but table level versioning. Because the goal was to build bulk inserts, very efficient query processing. And when you're working with that model, we were willing to say one writer at a time, right? So different design, but that means you can't deal with concurrency at all. When the, when the HANA idea of uh, main and delta came along, that kind of, we kind of said, you know, that makes a lot of sense. And, the, and that's an addition that we can make to the disk-based IQ processing by adding a Delta store on top. 
But now, one difference between Hana's merge and IQ's merge, of course, is that uh, uh, we are merging. So effectively, what we are doing is we're saying we keep the table level versioning for IQ big data store. We add the data store on top that is able to handle concurrent OLTP style trickle loads, but we switch from a table lock to a row level lock while these things are running. And when the merge comes, now it's a different beast. The concept is the same, that you're tracking changes into a, into a columnar in-memory store, but the merge is slightly different. We're not, we can't afford to rebuild the underlying uh, IQ store because it's potentially gonna be uh, not doable. Uh, but at the same time, the IQ engine already knows how to do bulk ingest very efficiently. So then the merge basically says, okay, if you're gonna do the merge effectively as a giant load from the delta changes into, I mean, of course, a delete, a bulk delete followed by a bulk insert. But we can do that as a transaction that IQ already knows about as an internal transaction. Um, so going back to the question, the, 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 even before we added NSC, the, there is, as I said, a, a memory manager and a buffer manager in the HANA in-memory processing engine, right? Because, because there is still this concept of loading columns and unloading columns. And then uh, that's kind of like uh, a buffer uh, mem cache manager, except that the granularity of the management is at the column vector level, the whole column. But then from there, changing that to this page loadable column we talked about, so it's kind of like they become the same kind of techniques at a high level, right? You're talking about less memory than your total data sets. Granularity is different. You're still talking about eviction policies. You're still talking about, so some basic concepts are similar, right? And as we add NSC now, of course, then the, the 30 years of uh, disk-based database processing techniques at a concept level will transport over. Yeah. That make sense? Yeah. Uh, one last question is, how long does it take to restart the 48 terabyte machine? It can take a while. Days. Well, um, so, <clears throat> yes, uh, but, <laughs> but, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but, the, but this base system had the same problem. Let me go back to SQL anyway, right? Uh, it's a normal system, when the database starts, restarts, I always do the same activity, let's say, right? So typical application would be, uh, so the, what I'm getting to is this problem is not unique in some sense, and similar techniques will apply, right? So imagine this, uh, it's an embedded database, and so therefore it is designed to shut down. You can configure it in a way where the database is not doesn't run. When the application first starts, first connection comes, the database starts up. When the application stops, the database stops. You have to do that, right? So now, the, the first thing the application does when it comes up is present you a screen. So think uh, Quicken or some sort of financial software, right? The first thing it does is starts up and presents a query, presents a screen. The screen comprise, comprises of 100 uh, queries to the database, right? If you do nothing, then you're effectively starting with a cold cache and uh, it could take you uh, two or three seconds not acceptable. So then we added stuff into the engine, for example, where it uh, the engine remembered uh, what were the pages that were brought into memory at engine start, it, and certain number of pages. It remembers that, and as the database is starting before it's receiving queries, it pre-warms the cache with those pages. So those are the kind of things we can do uh, and will do, do here as well. But uh, but one thing I should point out there is that uh, there's a lot of work we are doing with uh, persistent memories. And, uh, and one thing that persistent memories can help with is fast restarts, right? Almost instantaneous restarts. And uh, so, so yes, but restart time is a, restart time is a, an issue in that context, but it's also an issue in the, in the HADR scenarios where you're failing over and which is why now some people want to have a hot standby where the system is replaying the 
it's ready yeah, to go. If you're, if you're running a 48 terabyte memory machine at, at hot state, but it's expensive. But yes. if you're running 48 terabytes, you have money. Yeah. <laughs> All right, any last question? <clears throat> All right, let's thank uh, Neil again. Thank you. Again, as he said, the, there's another Tech Talk tomorrow at 12. That'll be in CIC in the fourth floor. That one will be pizza. Uh, and the final presentations will be Monday. I think we're May something sixth or fifth. Uh, so I'll send out a reminder. Let's do it at this room, not where we're, we're signed. And then let's do it at 9 a.m., not the 8.30 if they set us up, OK? Uh, and then I'll send a reminder out uh, about the, the second code review um, and what's expected in the final presentations. And then if anybody has a question about how to write the final exam uh, or doesn't know what paper to pick, let me know. Uh, we, 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 they had to write a, a sort of a two-page essay about what paper they want to add to our system. They can't do the HANA garbage collector because these guys are actually already, already implemented it. All right, so they have to pick something else. OK? Uh, anything else? All right, guys, it's been an awesome semester. Good luck with your other exams or other classes. Uh, for those of you who are graduating, you will, everyone will pass this class, so <laughs> like, it's not, don't freak out. Uh, good luck. I can't help with your other classes. Um, and then uh, I will send an email about uh, internships and, and, and full time positions for database companies if you're interested. Okay? All right, guys. See you on Monday. Thank you. Got a bounce to get the 40 ounce bottle. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't no puzzle, I'll guzzle because I'm more man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label No shorts with the cross, you know I got them I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom Throw about three in the freezer so I can kill it Careful with the bottle, baby, you just don't spill it Cause St. Isles is said, the paint is red You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head Take back the pack of duds You go get you some St. Isles and drink it to the studs Billy D is the chili cheese, sit down with the weak guys Be a man and get a can of St. Isles